Well, good morning. Can you hear me okay? So I'd like to begin by thanking Gage for that fantastic introduction. I am incredibly honored and grateful um, to have the invitation to be a, a part of this conversation with you today. And I especially appreciate um, uh, President Bounds' challenge to all of us to think big, because the story I'm gonna share with you today actually came from a challenge, from a challenge to think quite big. And that challenge to us came from Jeff Rakes. Many of you in this room may recognize Jeff's name. His family um, is, hails from Ashland, Nebraska. His family's made tremendous contributions to the agriculture industry in our state over the years. You may also recognize Jeff's name as the leader of the Microsoft Office development team, and later he served as the CEO of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. So this is someone who thinks big. And he challenged us as researchers and scientists to think big. And he said, how do you address a grand challenge at Nebraska? How do you create the future of agriculture? This was a really big task for us. And we would come to Jeff with ideas and he'd be, that's a good start. Think bigger. And so we've, again, focused our efforts on the future of agriculture. And we wanted to be very strategic about how we addressed this grand challenge. How do you create agriculture 2.0? And so we asked ourselves, essentially three questions. How do we be not just a leader, but how do we be the leader? How do we identify areas where we compete and compete well? And how do we be sustainable in addressing a grand challenge? So back to the grand challenge. How do we create Agriculture 2.0? And so we decided to ask ourselves some questions and, and question a current fundamental approach that we have to agriculture. And so we thought about the things that we already do well. Where do we focus in production agriculture, especially as it relates to crop production? Where are we focused? We're focused on crops that have a greater yield per acre. We're focused on crops that are disease resistant. And we want to be efficient with our use of resources so that we can feed the world for less money. And we do these things in Nebraska. And we do them very well. But what if we could do more? What if we're missing a piece of a much larger puzzle? What if we selected crops not for agronomic traits, but also, or in addition to, for health benefits? What if we could raise crops in Nebraska that improved our health, prevented human diseases, could be intervention for diseases, and essentially be able to, pe to feed people not only more food, but food that improves their health and their lives. To me, that's a grand challenge. And more importantly, as a microbiology researcher here at Nebraska, among a fantastic team of scientists, we think we have an answer. We think we have a novel answer. And it involves the community of microbes that live in your gastrointestinal tract. So it's really good that you guys have asked me to speak here before any sort of meal because I am not an ideal lunch or dinner speaker, I might add. But I want to point out to you that you have multitudes of microorganisms associated with your body, especially in your gastrointestinal tract. And these organisms are there for our benefit. It may be quite obvious to you that they help us with our digestion. But they can do more than that. They can interact with our host physiology, our body responses, to have benefits for our health. Unfortunately, we've learned that abnormalities in this population of gut microbes are also associated with many, many complex diseases. You heard Gage mention a couple of them in my introduction. We think, however, that modulation of this microbial community provides us a really unique opportunity to be able to address issues around human health. The good news is, that our gut microbes eat the same foods we eat. And we also know that diet is the number one factor that can influence the composition of the microbiome. And so if you go back to those list of three questions that I presented to you earlier about how does Nebraska address a grand challenge, we identify our strengths and the things that we do well. And so we think that dietary modulation of the gut microbial community presents a fantastic opportunity for us in Nebraska to unite our strengths in agriculture 
as well as our strengths in medicine, and especially for those of us here in Lincoln to think beyond just our UNL campus borders and reach out to other faculty and scientists all across the University of Nebraska system, especially our colleagues at the University of Nebraska Medical Center. So again, uniting what we already do very well. So it may be quite obvious to many of you in the room what diseases we can modulate or improve if we change the gut microbiota. There's all sorts of gastrointestinal diseases that have links to the gut microbiota. But I would challenge you, much as Jeff challenged us, to think bigger. There are many more opportunities to affect positive outcomes on, health, on our health if we think outside the gastrointestinal tract. We have links between gut microbes and all the diseases that I have on this list behind me. And more importantly, we have expertise at the University of Nebraska Medical Center in these areas where we can reach out across campuses to address a grand challenge. So one of the things I want to emphasize to you today is that this is not de novo. We have been building on our strengths and our existing infrastructure for years. Ten years ago, we actually started doing research on the gut microbial ecosystem here at the University of Nebraska. We had fantastic investigators that had amazing support from the department, from the Institute of Ag and Natural Resources, and it launched a group that is understanding the basic science behind the gut ecosystem. And there's been many fantastic discoveries, but the number one discovery that we've learned that has positioned us for where we are today is that diet is the number one factor that manipulates the gut microbiota. And we can harness that and use that to our advantage to be able to have a positive influence on human health. So back to the question about how we address our grand challenge. This is a big question. And we can't do it on one campus alone. We need to reach out all across the University of Nebraska system to existing strengths and bridge these areas of excellence together. And so many of you may recognize existing infrastructure and resources all across the University of Nebraska system on this slide behind me. We didn't have to create these. These were already here and doing amazing things. There's also amazing people all across the University of Nebraska system that are a part of our Food for Health endeavor. So now that we've united these resources and infrastructure and united this human talent, we can ask some very unique questions. So I'm not gonna stand up here and tell you that we're the only people in this country asking questions about the gut microbiota. There are plenty of folks that are asking and even can get answers to the first two questions on my list. They're studying what microbes are in our gastrointestinal tract and how are they associated with diseases. But I believe that we are one of the few groups, not only in the country, but around the world, that can ask and answer question number three. And that is, how can we take our resources and learn to manipulate and change the gut microbiota in very predictable ways that enhance human health. And by us answering question three, that puts us in a position to move away from basic discovery, and it puts us in a fantastic position to be able to translate our findings into human health. So how do you make that translation? we created a pipeline. And the great thing about this pipeline is, again, it builds on strengths and resources that we already have across the University of Nebraska system. I'm gonna start at the beginning, at the pipeline, with crop diversity. The Institute of Agriculture and Natural Resources has amazing genetic resource populations in a variety of crops. Sorghum, maize, wheat, the, the list is, is quite long. So if you harness the natural genetic diversity in plants, can we use that as a way to identify novel dietary compounds that can modulate the gut microbiota? So this image that you see here is a field of sorghum. Look at the diversity. You've got tall plants, short plants, very obvious phenotypic diversity. Just imagine what's under the hood 
at the molecular level. Novel molecules, novel pathways that we've yet to discover. And so by doing some fairly straightforward in vitro screening test, simple in practice, but the graduate students that have been doing this already will tell you it's not a simple, trivial task. You take the seeds from these plants and you incubate them in a dish in the laboratory with human fecal samples. And not just samples from one or two people, but you harness the genetic, or excuse me, the diversity in human microbiomes. And you look to see how do these plants, the seeds from these plants, modulate these microbiomes. We've already screened over a thousand lines of maize and sorghum by hand. We are in the process of automating this with robotics. The graduate students are grateful that they no longer have to do all the hand pipetting. But more importantly, we're going to fail, but we're going to fail rapidly. But that also gives us the opportunity to identify novel dietary candidates. And what we can do next in the pipeline is move into animal studies, move into in vivo models. We have germ-free mice at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. These mice are a blank canvas. We can take the human microbiomes that we've been screening in the laboratory, we can put them into animals, we can feed these animals the lead candidate molecules, and we can see, does the gut microbiome change in the same way in the animal that we predicted that it would from our in vitro screen? Then we can move on. We can make use of the marmoset resources that we have at the University of Nebraska Omaha at the Calatricid Research Center, where we can have an intermediate model between mice and then eventually before we move into feeding humans. And so we can aim this pipeline with our lead candidate molecules at healthy human populations that we bring in through the clinical infrastructure that we have at the Food Innovation Center on Innovation Campus, and we can work with our colleagues at the University of Nebraska Medical Center. And so what this translation of discovery into benefits for people allows us to do is not only make us a leader in the agriculture industry, but it allows us to jumpstart the economic engines that we have here in the state of Nebraska. There is a tremendous amount of IP associated with what we're doing here. And this is not something that we have to wait 10 years to realize the benefits. We're already seeing them. We already have patents, even licenses, for products that we've generated through our efforts at the University of Nebraska and the Food for Health Center. We are already working with companies, food companies, pharmaceutical companies. They're excited, and they're excited for what's to come. Because you can see that we have midterm goals, we have long-term goals. It may be very obvious to you that we're going to find novel dietary fibers from screening all these crops and all these plants. But think bigger. We think there's an opportunity to find novel, non-fiber molecules, and these can be tremendous game changers. So this really provides us an opportunity to be an economic driver for the state of Nebraska. Jeff challenged us to think big. So what I'm about to tell you is a pretty audacious goal for us. And as scientists, myself included, sometimes we're very cautious with what we say. But what if? What if we could have a nutrition label on a food or a crop that was produced here in Nebraska that had an FDA-approved claim for a health benefit for a particular disease and a reduction in disease risk? That's a pretty audacious goal, and we think we can get there. We've been very blessed to have um, investments from the Jeff Rakes Foundation, from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, who believe in us and are willing to fund our first couple of years with a rapid um, startup funding. And we have tried to be strategic. So much as Jeff challenged us to think big, he also challenged us to think sustainably. And so what we've done is we've placed these investments at critical linkages between the existing infrastructure that we have and that allows us to be productive while we continue to go out and fundraise in order to meet our goals for the long-term sustainability of our center. And then finally, my last thought to share with you, as we develop new ideas, a new industry, and a new way of thinking, we need to be able to train the leadership, the future generations, to work in these innovative areas. 
And at the university, we're very good at training students. And we want to leverage the existing programs and infrastructures, especially the PhD program in complex biosystems, where we can have Nebraska Food for Health graduate fellows that are going out to be the face of a new industry and a new way of thinking for, um, for food production in the state of Nebraska. You see photos on here, I can tell you a success story for every photo that's on the slide. We are already doing things well for training students. The investments that we have from Jeff and the challenges from Jeff just encourage us to think bigger. And so with that, I will close and take any questions. Nope, no questions, sorry. He's shaking his head no, no questions. <laughs> so um, on that note, I will close and then I can make a rapid exit so there's no questions, right? <laughs> Great. Thank you all.